Thank you, Susan, and hi, guys. <laughs> the, uh, so this is a long title, uh, but we can really translate the purpose of the main message, which hopefully will come across very quickly, is that uh, the NIH, the NCI, uses the term, which those of us who were involved in the renewals in the past know is value added. Uh, we uh, have two kinds of research that we bring together, but the main purpose of the NCI designation is that we're supposed to do things better because we're an NCI designated center. And this is going to be, I hope you'll agree, a good example of that. Uh, at the outset, I just say uh, many people have contributed uh, to what we'll be discussing, but what we'll be highlighting today really can divide the team into two parts. The basic team over on your left, uh, who are responsible for a lot of the findings that we'll be discussing, if not the, uh, a majority, are the team from dermatology who came together in large measure around this project. But on your right, is a group of individuals that have been selected from many who really came together as part of this in critical ways because they are in the cancer center. And that's how we came together. There's a group uh, from bioengineering, the, the group from right above them, I skip by it, from the Keck facility, medical oncology, pathology, laboratory medicine, and cell biology. But really, it was the cancer center uh, that brought us all together. I should say that our group, including myself, have some conflicts of interest. Yale University owns multiple patents. Uh, they've come out of uh, this work. Uh, and as individuals named on the patents as well, uh, we have the opportunity uh, to perhaps benefit, but no one will benefit uh, from this unless what I tell you is true and unless what I tell you also has a continuing impact on human beings affected by cancer and the like. Pre-summary of the lecture. Extracorporeal photochemotherapy is a mouthful. It's a mouthful because we didn't understand at the time it was named precisely uh, how it works and we'll be talking about that this is homegrown at Yale. This is a treatment that was developed here uh, by our group and by uh, several of you and has now been exported to over 200 centers throughout the United States and Europe. It was the first FDA-approved cellular immunotherapy for any cancer. Uh, the underlying scientific mechanism, uh, however, has been quite elusive. We'll talk about uh, a bird's eye view of two of the insights. First, the fact that we now have very strong evidence that this therapy uh, is associated, if not dependent on, an efficient and rapid generation of a very large amount of maturationally synchronized dendritic antigen presenting cells and the return of those cells to the patient. And uh, we'll touch on some immunotherapeutic implications of these findings. Uh, this started many years ago now uh, because of our recognition in that interface specialty, dermatology, which is an interface organ between the external and in, uh, environment and the inside environment, that there was a drug that was already well known uh, to dermatologists, which is a remarkable and very likely, or at least arguably, the most finely titratable pharmacologic agent, potent agent in all of medicine. This tricyclic small molecule, furacumarin, 8-methoxysorolin, which I'll abbreviate as 8-MOP, uh, is naturally occurring in nature. Many plants uh, make it as a primitive defense against larval infections because the drug is photoactivated. It's completely inactive by itself, but it's photoactivated by long-wave, low-energy ultraviolet light, and it then becomes as potent a DNA cross-linking agent as exists. To give you a quick sense of why this drug, which can be turned on by a light switch and is only active for millions of a second when it's turned on, 
is so finely tunable. Here you see a phytohemagglutinin, PHA, response, which stimulates most normal T cells to proliferate. And you can then just simply measure 100 percent response uh, by the amount of tritiated thymidine, which is incorporated over three days. Uh, and you see that at very low exposures at the bottom of your screen, to a combination of ultraviolet activating energy and 8-MOP, the T cell response to PHA is completely abrogated, a value there of 100. At the same time, you see that something that is very difficult to do, if not impossible to do with almost all other agents, is a window is opened between monocyte viability and loss of T cell function because you can so finely tune this drug. A drug that works somewhat like it, but is always turned on, like mitomycin C, cannot do this. And if you look at the white line, uh, well, first, if you take a look and say, okay, let's draw, let's choose a point when 83 percent of the monocytes are still viable, and all of the T cells are no longer functional, how much of the drug is actually required for that? Well, by making monoclonal antibodies, which we did in the past, against the DNA photoaddicts, it was able to demonstrate that only three photoaddicts per million base pairs of DNA by this pyrimidine binding cross-linking agent are required to do this. This is an extremely potent agent, active for millionths of a second. The lights go off and the unbound drug is off. There is no, and this is key, there is no systemic immunosuppression associated with a drug that is extracorporeal activated because there is no active drug that the inside of the body, other than what you targeted, is actually targeted by this, there's no impact. So years ago, with the help of Johnson & Johnson, a system was developed to allow this treatment, which has been very commonly used before that in the treatment of psoriasis, say, could you actually treat the blood of patients with this treatment? And the treatment, of course, as Susan indicated, that we're very interested in, the disease, which was a tremendous nightmare at the time, was the leukemic phase of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma because nothing really worked. And I'll show you in a second. But basically, what was then devised schematically was that the patient initially took the drug by mouth, like the psoriasis patients do, and later it was in soluble form so you could have an exact concentration in the apparatus added directly to the flow. Passed then through this very flat snake-like plate, only one millimeter thick or thin film, because although you could remove the majority of the red cells which interfered with light penetration, you couldn't get the hematocrit down below 2 percent, and there was still, uh, as you'll see, a lot of red cells in 2 percent. So it was one millimeter, lights on both sides, and then the cells were returned, and the idea was that this would be a chemotherapeutic agent entirely focused on the blood. You'd rely on the reticular endothelial system to remove the damaged cells, and you were worried, as we were, about tumor lysis syndrome if you killed the cells too fast. So you did it as gently as you could. This is the apparatus that Johnson & Johnson made uh, through several generations. You see the intense lights. You see the very thin plate. First, a centrifuge phase, a leukophoresis phase, to enrich for the mononuclear cells and decrease the hematocrit, then the exposure, then the return of the cells to the patient. So I'm, uh, you know, some sort of makeshift oncologist. So you have to forgive me. An attention deficit, I need to see a response, like my colleagues do, early or we don't actually continue the study. The, so the patient, it has to be dramatic, and it had to be dramatic. And this first patient was the patient all the way back in 1982, treated essentially through just three cycles, essentially three treatments at a monthly, at monthly basis, treating only 5 percent of his tumor burden as it passed through the apparatus, and returned to see what would happen. You see his total body erythroderma, red, edematous skin, with literally trillions of copies of the malignant clone in this skin-homing but circulating 
leukemic phase. And you see the fissures in his hands uh, just due to the disease. What was surprising and remarkable in this very first patient was that in treating only 5%, actually less than 5% of his estimated tumor burden and returning them, he cleared completely. It was stunning. So we didn't know at that point. Remember, we were trying to do chemotherapy. We didn't know that rather than accelerating like we were going to do to get ahead of the rate of reproduction, we didn't expect an immunologic response, but that's what this was. And then we saw it in a second patient out of the first five. It had never happened before. That disease does not do that spontaneously. And so there was a big question as to why this happened, how to continue to do it, what was going on mechanistically, but there was no question that something significant was happening, something very significant. And we treated this patient through the end of the next year because we frankly didn't know what we were doing and we didn't know how to stop. Okay, so we stopped at the end of 1983, and his disease, as well as the disease in the other patient, never came back. This individual died at the age of 92, just a couple of years ago, of natural causes, like we used to say. Okay, what are natural causes? Uh, that initiated an international trial, and because of the success of that trial and because of our conservatism, we waited until 1987 to publish that trial in the New England Journal. Uh, but if you stop here and just now compress a lot of history into this one slide, what is the immunotherapeutic question that came out of this and what's happened over those 20 years, plus years? First, because of the extremely high response rate and the excellent safety profile, it became the first-line therapy for the leukemic phase of CTCL. The immunologic basis, although the reasons for it weren't clear at the time, was pretty well highlighted by a few phenomena. First of all, 80% of the patients who had a, an intact CD8 T cell system at the time they were treated responded well. Zero percent, essentially, of those who didn't have an intact CD8 T cell count responded. So clearly CD8 T cells were involved somehow. The fact that we never got a chance to rev it up because it was an immunologic treatment, that 5% of the cells returned could induce this, suggested that in fact they carried the antigens. The persistence of the complete responses which are now extremely documented in many, many patients worldwide, also suggested an ongoing response after you stop treating these people, often for many years. And then by PCR, the demonstration in those complete responders that the clone was gone indicated that something remarkably selective had happened. And finally, in a disease that typically like AIDS, this is the flip side of the immunologic coin, but the same immunologic paralysis, a disease that typically caused death by, through opportunistic infections and a compromised immune system, it didn't happen. So something selective was going on here. How, these, how the immune system could somehow be triggered by this cockamamie approach wasn't clear at all. Now, a quick bird's eye view, again, of graft versus host disease following bone marrow allo transplant. Turning point was later, but in the year 2000, a study from the University of Vienna by Greinix demonstrated in patients who had to, by definition, and still have to, by definition, have failed conventional immunotherapy. So this is a distillation of the people that don't respond to conventional therapy. If you looked overall at these patients, you see in the, in the shaded red bar, these are the people who at one month were already quickly showing a response overall, and that more than half, almost 60% of the patients overall, <coughs> had complete responses after other therapy had failed. If you look at the patients in the low-grade graft-versus-host disease, you see that at one month, again, almost 60%, and at three months, showing that this is really 
almost certainly causing these responses. All of them had complete responses. In grade three, it goes up to 60% at three months. And in grade four, the most aggressive form, it doesn't do anything. And we don't know whether it would have made a difference because it never gets tried, by definition, before the disease gets to that grade. So there is an open question there, but clearly not shown to be effective in the most aggressive form after other therapies have failed. So what's the question here? Although this should be confusing you a little bit right now. The efficacy is established in graft-versus-host disease, heart and lung transplants. In fact, of the total greater than 1.5 million times that this treatment has been used in Europe and the United States in those over 200 centers, now almost two-thirds of the treatments are used in graft-versus-host disease. 30% in leukemic cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, and 10% because simply there aren't that as many patients in organ transplant. But the question is, again, why is this apparently so selective? And this is the other side of the immunologic coin. On the one hand, it's immunizing patients against their CTCL, and on this hand, it's regulating the immune response. But it's exactly the same treatment, sometimes given at a little different frequency. But how? And again, no increased infection rate. So a lot of interest worldwide, over 700 as of last week, peer-reviewed publications trying to figure it out and reviewing it. So if you go, though, back over the three decades since it was introduced, there have been, this is a distinction of sorts, but a little dubious distinction in a way as well, because not that many disorders uh, or therapies have been, have appeared three times in the New England Journal of Medicine for three different indications over three decades, and all start, including ours, by saying, unfortunately, the mechanism is unclear. <laughs> okay. But rather driven by profound therapeutic index. Well, uh, as we know, although there was a lot of NIH money here and elsewhere used, along with other funding sources, to go after the mechanism, uh, you can't do this in this kind of big style without some people, that dirty word, industrial support. And so over $150 million of Johnson & Johnson money has gone into trying to figure this out. A lot of it's been here. And there were many uh, reported clinical trials, some of which are highlighted here. Uh, one of the most uh, public, but the largest ratio I've ever seen of authors to patients, the face transplant you saw in the news a couple of years ago, and now, I mean, it's, but the empiricism was definitely ruling supreme across cancer, transplant, autoimmunity. We developed, along with others, a bunch of animal models. They demonstrated some of the phenomenology to be legit, but you can't be a reductionist, unfortunately, if you don't know all the variables. So this is not, this is a reductionist nightmare until now. Okay. So what we're going to talk about very briefly, very briefly, uh, is the fact that we now have a good idea from transcriptome studies how this works. The, but the conundrum, again, is how can a single treatment cause an upregulation and a downregulation and uh, the potential answer, which I'll show you very quickly, is that this induces massive quantities of dendritic cells in comparison to other therapies, but it does it in a way which might be more physiologic because it's faster than the excellent laboratory systems that were developed to enable studying them, which take much longer. And that, 
and this just, I'll say this slowly because I won't be able to go into this, as a broad sweeping generalization, the immature dendritic cells have a propensity to turn off and the mature ones, because of the higher expression of costimulatory molecules, possibly the same cells, have a tendency to turn on. So the dendritic cells may be at a pivotal position to actually do either one. And we'll come back to that. But quickly, this is the plate. Now you see, even at a 2% hematocrit, it's still pink. There are a lot more red cells than there are leukocytes in here. And those are a shield. The reason why those laboratory models, and a lesson to all of us who like to be reductionists, we do. That's good science. The reason why, and we're the biggest culprit, that those animal models turn out not to be valid is because they didn't incorporate this plate. It's happening in this plate. And no one, including Johnson & Johnson, has an incentive to make a photophoresis machine for a mouse. Okay? <laughs> so this plate does not exist in any of those experimental models. But if you look at this, you see that when the cells get processed, and instead of return to the patient, passage through the plate, the light, the activated drug, spin in the centrifuge, the whole thing, if you hold on to them for a day and watch them, look in the green bars at the tremendous expression of combination of CD83 and HLADR as a uh, as a marker of dendritic cell maturation from processed <coughs> monocytes. And remember that normally less than one-tenth of one percent estimated of your circulating mononuclear cells are dendritic cells. They circulate in one form at least as monocytes and become dendritic cells putatively when they get into the need to process antigen, but not when they're circulating in the highway of the peripheral blood. But this is huge. This is a huge increase. And so quickly, the working model at that point was that, and the data was consistent with this, was that it was a tale of two cities, cells. The, the monocytes, which are very sticky to the plastic because of the flow, can't stick to the plastic in that very extensive flat plate. Watched overnight, they take on these features morphologically and and phenotypically of dendritic cells. The lymphocytes, however, are very sensitive to the light. They, when co-incubated, get internalized, rapidly digested, and very likely have their antigens expressed. And since CD8 T cells against CTCL cells are generated in the process with some specificity for the malignant cells of the particular patient, at least this was the working concept. Goodbye but of course it's easy to make cartoons. The, but if you take a closer look, you see something in comparison that when everybody does things the same way, if you make your dendritic cells by taking monocytes and incubating them with GMCSF and, and IL-4, uh, at day five, look at the bottom and look at how heterogeneous the population that's made the conventional way is. Before you try to squeeze them together at six and seven days with a second maturational step. But that's not, I mean, no one thinks that that's actually the way it happens in people. That just happens to be the best way conventionally to get them to study in humans. But if you look at the cells that come off from the apparatus incubated for one day, look at the homogeneity and you see that 97% of those cells develop significant quantities of this co-stimulatory molecule CD86, also known as B72, whereas only 60% do it in the conventional approach at that point. And look at how homogeneous, not surprisingly at one day, the cells are to come off. Maybe this is an explanation in part for why dendritic cell immunotherapy doesn't tend to work that well if you do it most ways. Okay, so this is a challenge. Okay, so, okay, so the, I will condense the rest of this into five seconds. <laughs> okay, okay, 
Uh, forget this. Just take a look at how pretty this is. Okay. Okay. The, 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 what turns out has happened when you study the transcriptomes of the cells that come out of CTCL patients, GVHD patients, and normal subjects processed through an equivalent laboratory apparatus, you see that they share upregulation of 498 genes. And if you look at those genes, you see that amongst them, several of the most well-recognized DC dendritic cell distinguishing genes by those ratios. Anything above two is significant in terms of the upregulation of the gene are tremendously upregulated. So what's happening here is not monocytes screaming, what are you doing to me with the spin and the irradiation, but they are actually being induced to go into the dendritic cell pathway very substantially. Okay, mind if I pass this one? Okay. Uh, the bottom line, however, was that the signal transduction pathway, which with a high probability was being responsible, or at least for a significant fraction of those genes, at the cell surface seemed to be triggered by RGD tripeptide-containing proteins including fibronectin and vitronectin. And another one, because it had to be happening in a plate, so it had to be a plasma protein, if it's involved, was fibrinogen. Because basically monocytes have receptors, they have integrin alpha-5 beta-1 receptors for this arginine, glycine, aspartame, don't know why aspartame is D, but repetitive RGD components that stick, and these proteins stick and coat the plastic. They're very sticky to plastic. So in fact, as we got into this, with that clue, it turned out that there may not be, within just a few seconds, any bare plastic. So what the monocytes are interacting with is protein-coated plastic. And I'm just going to show you, and then stop. Uh, Miss? Did I miss something there? If you coat, here we go. If you coat the plastic with fibrinogen, which Tyler DeRazzo did, and then with platelets, the platelets stick to stick to the fibrinogen, and now you're looking at the monocytes jumping essentially from platelet to platelet. And so I don't have time to go into this, but what really becomes very interesting is, let's go outside this, is this. Uh, if you go back to your physics classes, which of course we barely can, <laughs> you recognize that in fluid dynamics, when water flows through a pipe, for example, or flows through any space that's walled off, the material, the fluid, flows faster in the middle and drags along the surface. So if you imagine monocytes, let's say, as shown here with these spheres, the fastest moving cells in the, are in the middle and just as you just saw, but with aided with the sticking and unsticking to the platelets, along the surface, they're creeping along. Now, if you add to it the fact that we are, are hitting these, this plate with a lot of ultraviolet A energy on both sides, you can imagine that, in fact, with the red cells that are in there, there is a significant gradient of what happens to the cells that are passing. The cells that are rolling along the, the surface slowly are close to the surface, unshielded by the red cells, going through the field at a snail's pace, and they are getting 
stimulated by the integrin receptors on the platelets, uh, as well, I mean, by, by actually uh, the fibrinogen and the fibronectin that are made by the platelets through the receptors that we talked about on the monocytes, but the cells that are in the middle are not even at the beach, okay? So there's a tremendous difference in the amount of exposure that the cells get at the surface and in the middle. So there are, at the two ends of the spectrum, distinct populations here. There are some monocytes that get very little. The shaking, they get some stimulation at the surface. They do become dendritic cells, but they don't get their evolution to, ma to, to mature dendritic cells truncated. And it remains to be proven, but it's certainly a very attractive premise that those cells can become immunogenic because they become high expressors. The cells that get roasted, they still are alive as they go back into the patient. They have their maturation as Abby Baird has begun to demonstrate, truncated by the 8-MOP that's activated by the light, and they have a chance short-term to be immunosuppressive. So there are, in fact, cells going back in in the dendritic cell series that can do both of those things. And the ones that could immunize con against cancer, theoretically, because they certainly, some do, they are around for a longer time. So at least now, this can be, uh, this can be examined. And so now we have, we started out with a drug that was the most titratable of all that we use, but we didn't know that it wasn't just a drug in the light. It's the flow rate. It's whether you have the lights on and off, because there, there is this thing called a light switch. You can turn it on and off if you want to. There's the fibrinogen concentration, and there's the platelet concentration. This is a really, we really can find out what we're doing. This is a really titratable system. So bottom line at the end, just say very quickly, what are the implications? First, in the simplest way, because we haven't really proven that the fact that we're making a huge number of synchronized dendritic cells are really responsible for these effects. That's going to be a tough thing to show. But what we have, it'll be a hell of a coincidence, okay? But what we have shown is that this is a terrific source for dendritic cell-based therapeutics in general. It's easy to make. There are 200 places in the world already that can do it, including Yale. And you can get a lot of these in one day. Uh, second, what about the rest of cancers? Well, one of the reasons, one of the attractions, if mechanistically this is on target in CTCL, is that the circulating cells are in the blood and they get exposed. But there's nothing that says that you couldn't do the same thing if you could gain access to other immunogenic cancers. You'd have to bring the cells into suspension, you'd have to injure them, maybe the same way, and you'd have to give them to the dendritic cells but it's something that can be looked at. And it appears that with the titrational system that we're talking about, one may now be able to really maximize or begin to explore ways to do the immunoregulation or the immunization without superimposing them. So that's a lot. Thank you for your attention and thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to share with you the Cancer Center, because this wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for a Cancer Center. So thank you. <laughs>